Good morning, church. Good to have you with us this morning. Amarillo has been hit hard this week, the last couple of weeks, and I want to start this morning. We're live, uh, but I want to start in prayer and definitely want to start and pray uh, that God would intercede on behalf of the saints, that we would persevere as saints, and that we would definitely see this terrible, terrible sickness be defeated in the name of Jesus. So if you would pray with me, Father God, I just pray with the saints abroad, as well as the saints that are here this morning. Father, we intercess for this community. We intercess for Amarillo, for Lubbock, for the Texas Panhandle, and around the world. Father, your word says that we have not because we ask not, and we ask for healing. We ask that the hospitalizations would be would start today, Father, to uh, the numbers would start to go down. And Father, that we would see a supernatural healing flow across this land. Father, that we would be a people who would repent. We would remember our baptisms. Father, that we would reach out and seek out to you, that we would be consistent and persistent in our prayers. Father, let us have today, Father, we ask this for wholeness, for healing upon our population that we serve. Lord Jesus, we love you and we thank you, Father, that you are our hope. In Jesus' name, amen. I would also like to express my thanks and gratitude to all the healthcare workers out there that are working diligently, um, patiently, and strategically to bring healing and wholeness back to people's lives as well. So as we get started this morning, I'm jumping back in to Family Ties Part 2. You guys, we're going to have a great time today. Stay with me. We're going to move quickly. God shows that His, His kingdom is supposed to be expressed through our communities of faith. And the basic community of faith is what, church? That's right, the family, the family. So where two or three are gathered in His name, there He is in their midst is what He says. He's, he starts in Genesis and He says, it is not good for man to be alone. He commands us to be fruitful and to multiply. In church, we can't do that on our own. All right? It's tough to be fruitful. It's tough to multiply by yourself. It won't happen. And we're created out of His image, in His image. It shines brighter through us as people who are drawn together. Through a family, a nation was born. Look, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, three generations and a nation. Imagine what America would be if we could get our church to start thinking generationally again. You know, the, the founding fathers of this great country that we're able to express our freedoms, they understood what it meant to, to sign their name on the dotted line. Benjamin Franklin said, we must all hang together or surely we will all hang separately. It's important that we understand what's been given for us. Because I'm telling you, if we don't start thinking generationally, Satan already has. I mean, I think back on 1962. I wasn't alive, but I think back on it. Like I read a lot of history books, by the way, just so you know. I'm reading one about Custer right now. But 1962, let's, we better take prayer out of schools. 1963, we better take the Bible out of schools. 1973, Roe versus Wade. 1980, we, we uh, uh, take all of the government Ten Commandments out of governmental institutions, or that's what they were supposed to do. In 1992, 1993, right in there, don't ask, don't tell. There's no doubt that the devil tends to think generationally what's happened to the church. Why aren't we thinking generationally? Some of the things that I mentioned today about family and family unit, I mean, I think of the Pope and what he put out today. 52% of professing Christians come out of the Catholic faith. And for him to make such a statement, such a claim is what he did. It really bothers me because it's, it's really in opposition to what the Word of God says. We've got to learn what it means to be a people of God again, what it means to have His Word embedded, not just in me, but also in my children's life, to think generationally, what's this going to look like 20, 30, 100 years from now? God wants What's best for you when the Pope mentioned the sanctity of marriage and, and those types of things, and yet he speaks about homosexuality and those types of things. Let me tell you something today, church, that if you struggle with homosexual tendencies, I'm not against you. I'm against the movement. 
I'm not opposed to you. Here's what I would say is that in reality, all of us have struggles that we are called to overcome in our lives. And, and, and being gay or feeling like you're being gay, that is not God's best for you. I would say it this way. There, we, we have people that, that start living together long before marriage, even have children long before marriage. I just want you to hear something. I'm not against you. But what I would say is it's not God's best for you. Many people would say that we're saved anyway. Study the word sozo. That's the Greek word for save. It's an ongoing process. And we are supposed to think of it that way in order for our next generation and the generation to follow that they too will walk in the one hope of their salvation as well as their calling. Study and show thyself approved is what the Word of God says because the Word of God is right. And even there are things and there are passages that I have to look at and say, this is a challenge for me. I was challenged this last week as we went through Kingdom Families with Miles Sweeney. Challenged in so many areas, feeling like I've come up short in my own life in areas that I should have been stronger with and in, especially as a pastor. Last week, we talked about the roles and the responsibility because as we go through this, we're talking about roles and responsibility in family ties, the roles and responsibilities that each person in the family has a responsibility to or towards. What What's the role of the child, right? To honor and obey. We covered that last week. Now, some of the children, I know what they say. Well, I didn't ask for you to be my parents. Well, just remember, they didn't, uh, the parents didn't ask for you to be their children. That, that cuts, that knife cuts both ways, right? They may have prayed for children, but they didn't know they were going to get you. Go back and listen to last week's message or watch last week's message and learn the role, what it means to honor and what it means to obey. Solomon stated in Proverbs 24, and this is our focus scripture this morning. And by the way, this would be a great scripture for you to write all throughout your house. It would be nice for the house to see this again. Proverbs 24, 3 and 4, through skillful and godly wisdom is a house, a home, a life, a family built. And by understanding it is established, it is established on a good foundation. And by knowledge shall the chambers of its every area be filled with precious and pleasant riches. I want a home that is filled with pleasant and present, precious and pleasant riches. To have a home such as this. You know, he starts out with the word skillful. The word skillful, skillful in the Greek, actually, it's, it's a, it's an interesting word because they take it from an archer's view. An archer had to be skilled. An archer to master the, the ability to be an archer. They had to masterfully set the arrow, draw it length and release at the perfect height in order for the bow to carry the arrow to the target that they were shooting at. Can you imagine what Solomon sees as he's writing out this this very verse in Old Testament Scripture? He's seeing this, this one who is skillful, who is masterful, who definitely designates a target, and he shoots an arrow directly at it, and he's saying this is how we ought to raise our families. Godly wisdom is the ability to seek God's will for our lives and also for the lives of our children. So we need to be skillful. We need to be intentional intentional about how God would direct us to build our families. So last week we talked about children's roles. Today we're going to talk about parental roles. Parents, parents, I'm talking to us. Now there's a couple of parent roles that I want us to, to just be aware of very quickly. The first one is parents on how to raise your children. It's very important that we get this established in our heart, deep down in our heart. But the second is this, parents, how do you take care of your parents? Because many of us still have parents that are alive. Many of us still have roles and responsibilities for our parents that are older now that require care or maybe have needs that we are supposed to supply for them. We'll cover that part next week. Today, I'm going to be talking about the parental parts of raising our children. The first thing a parent should know is this, that no matter how cute, no matter how much they look like their mom, no matter how obvious that they were created in the image of God, they may even look like God Himself. Your child still has a sin nature. 
and it's going to have to be addressed at some point. It's going to need to be dealt with. And the younger that it's dealt with, the better off you're going to be. Proverbs reminds us in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 1, a foolish son is the grief of his mother. Proverbs 17, 21, to have a fool for a son brings grief. There is no joy for the father of a fool. Both parents are included in that statement. Proverbs also reminds us that the son who is honorable to their parents brings glory upon them. What an incredible thing. Children that are honorable to their parents bring us glory. We're so proud of them and for them. Hosea 14.9, a very important scripture this morning. I'm going to come back to this over and over and over. over. Hosea 14.9, the ways of the Lord are right. We have to see that first and foremost as we raise our children up. His ways are right. There's a possibility that my way may be wrong. His ways are of the Lord. The ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but the rebellious, the rebellious stumble in them. They stumble, they trip, they trip them up. They know better, but they go on and do otherwise. Too many parents fence in their dogs at night and let their kids run free. I've seen this happen. I need to repeat that. Too many parents fence in their dogs at night and let their children run free. Uh, years ago, I was confronted. I, I taught a message and there happened to be a couple of pastors that were in the service that day and both of them set up a meeting. They came and talked to me and they said, Curtis, one thing that's obvious, you don't understand the sovereignty of God. And so they preached to me and they teach to me about the sovereignty of God. And I've always believed this. There is the sovereign hand of God, but there's also the free will of man. And where those cross, I don't claim to know, but both are active in our lives. And, and one of them, by the way, their child at the age of 14, bless her heart, and I wouldn't wish this on anyone, but she became pregnant because he didn't believe that she decided that she needed discipline, direction, or anything else that sovereignly God was going to do with her what needed to be done. Guys, I'm telling you, pay attention. God wants us to intervene in our children's lives all throughout Old Testament as well as New Testament. We are supposed to be thinking generationally. Generationally, it means we have a responsibility to our children and it never ends. If you're a parent, it never ends. Luke chapter 15, verse 11. Now you know this as the parable of the prodigal son. Some of you may know this as the parable of the lost son. I like to think of it as the parable of the parent. But let's look at it. Luke 15, 11, And he said, there was a man who had two sons. So if there's a man who had two sons, there must be a mother that has two sons. You get this? Stay with me. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. Now, that's as far in this story that I'm going to read, but I'm going to unpack all of it. You know where it's at now. It's in Luke chapter 15. You can read it today. Now, let me say this. There are two brothers here, and the younger ask his father for his inheritance. There's a problem. Remember, the way to interpret and study Scripture is first, who is it being written towards, or who heard it first? The Jewish people that were sitting in the presence of Jesus at that time understood what he was saying when he said, here is this parent, these parents, they, they, or, or this father, and this father has two sons, and the youngest asked for his inheritance. You see, the way that they would interpret that in their day and time, according to the Mishnah, and go read it. And if you want, if you want to know how to get it, I've got all of this in my notes. I read it myself to make sure I was saying this correctly. But basically the way they would have interpreted this is if the youngest came and asked for his inheritance, it meant uh, that first, the youngest person in the family usually received the least amount of inheritance. The oldest son would always receive double portion in, in the Jewish heritage or history. And it makes sense. You know why? Because they would think generationally. And so the oldest would have walked with their parents the longest. 
And because of that, they would have understood, this is how my inheritance works. This is what I must do in order to build upon what my father left me, what his father left him, what his father left him. So they would think generationally. So immediately when Jesus says, and the younger asked for his inheritance, there's an offensive statement in what Jesus has said. The other problem in this, well, there's two really major problems that, that come out of this, but with the younger asking for this, according to the Mishnah, it would mean that the youngest were already saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. I wish you were gone. You are a stumbling block into my future. Give me what's mine and let me get out of here. It's a rebellious nature. It's a rebellious state. Look, he got all of his belongings together. The father, to me, what he made the mistake or where he made the mistake is he said, wait a second, you little brat. Uh, I'm going to address this because the way adulthood happened, remember it happened much younger in their day and time as well, probably 12 to 14 here. This is how they were interpreting what they were hearing from Jesus. So Jesus immediately, through this parable, he has their attention. He's, he's grasped their attention. And here we go. This youngest one gets all of his belongings together, leaves the house for a distant country. He knows better than everyone else. He squandered his estate with loose living. If you read it in the NIV, it says with wild living. Some would say that he went out and sowed his wild oats. It's amazing in American culture. We think that's funny today. Oh, they'll come back to it. They're just out uh, uh, sowing their wild oats. Let me tell you something. It's not okay to sow your wild oats. It's not okay. You throw a lot. Matter of fact, Jesus would say that you're throwing your pearls to the swine. It's, it's not okay to do that. Now, what is okay is to go out and grow your wild oats. Put your hand to the plow. Go to work. You want to grow up? You want to show a level of maturity? Start taking care of the responsibilities that you have in your own household. And parents require that to be the case. So he goes out and in verse 15, he went and attached himself to one of the citizens of that country. This is what it means there. It means that he attached himself to this culture. In some ways, the world is always going to be the world. Here's, here's the truth. This guy, he breaks out. He attaches himself to the culture. And the shame in all of this is that the world, in some ways, is always going to be the world church. But it's a shame when the church is no longer the church. It's a shame when the house is no longer the house. We're called to protect the house of God, the Word of God. Huge responsibility. He believed that everybody else's ways, their thoughts, their opinions, their way of doing life, including his father, his parents, were wrong. And by the way, if you were at Kingdom Families, you'll, there, there were just two things that were really taught at Kingdom's family. One of them was the pouring in to your children. The other was purging out. And that boy <laughs> needed some purging out. Let's keep moving. The prodigal, though, he, he, the good thing, no matter how selfish he was, and, and though he runs and attaches himself to this culture, what he finds out is this culture is just as selfish as I am. And because we're all selfish, we're all trying to get me, myself, and I, that unholy trinity, fulfilled. And so he finds out, oh my goodness, this is a selfish culture. But here's the cool thing about the prodigal is he remembered his way back home. A way that would lead to life. A way that would, would bring him back to a place where he was brought up. A place of being loved, of being cared for, of being nourished. See, in order for this to happen with a prodigal, he had to lay aside some things to come home. His ambition wasn't necessarily wrong. I'm going to say here in just a moment some things I like about the prodigal. I like the fact that he was ambitious. Now, let me tell you what is wrong. Those of you who are with me this past Tuesday morning, I'm talking about Korah's rebellion. And, and you'll find out not through Numbers chapter 16, but through Jude, you'll find out that Korah's rebellion was a rebellion that was selfish. It was selfish ambition that led him to that rebellion. Now, this prodigal, I believe that is selfish ambition. But if you have ambition in you to strive and succeed in life, that's of God. Go get it. Here's what I love about unselfish people being successful. It means others are going to be blessed. But let's keep moving. I love to be around ambitious people. They inspire me. Some think he was after fine living, splendor, wealth, 
and power? I don't necessarily think so. I think he was after control. And instead of being blessed to go by his father, he felt he knew better than his father. And a matter of fact, instead of just going and making it on his own, he says, wait, before I can make it on his own, you need to give me a big paycheck before I can make it on my own. So dad, write it up. Now let's keep going. He's thinking, I need to live by my opinion, my ways, my thoughts, not by my father's. Now, careful, church, we can't judge too quickly here. It's easy to do that. We've all been the prodigal. We all tend to pick on people of the flesh. This guy has been beat up by every pastor out there, but who hasn't wanted control of their life at some point in time? Who of us haven't been deceived by the flesh? This man was seduced to leave the house. He wanted his blessing. He forgot that the way of the Lord is right. Always right. You know, I started to preach on Jacob and Esau. I, I shouldn't do this because we're online. We have a time limit here. But what did, why would Jacob want st to steal Esau's birthright? He gets double. It pays good when daddy goes on. Let's keep going. Why am I saying that? It's control, right? It's control. But let's not be too hard on this guy. All of us have been deceived by the flesh at some point in time. He wanted something and he went after it. He tried. He attempted. When he wanted a portion of goods, at least he asked for it. And by the way, his brother was rewarded because of it. Probably not to the extent he could have been or should have been. When the famine hit, he didn't pray in tongues. He went out and got a job. It was a bad one, but it revealed to him what he had left, what he had walked away from. A good home, people who loved him, who helped him, who had an inheritance, uh, uh, an opportunity for him down the road if he would have just waited. This man moved. He changed. I love the fact that he was passionate. Church, we've got to learn to celebrate when these people come back. Instead of condemning, celebrate when they come back. There's a call to them this morning. Remember the ways of the Lord. Hosea said it, the ways of of the Lord, church, I can't emphasize this enough, are right. They're for our good. Now this other son, let's talk about the other son because there's two of them and the other son's frustrated. He's silently frustrated. I'm sorry that none of you know what I'm talking about right here. Right? He's silently frustrated. He's in the house, but no one knows he's there. Right? He's never stepped out. He's always played it safe. He's never rocked the boat. He's self-righteous. He's a procrastinator. He didn't necessarily have fleshly or visible sin that we read about. He's nice. He's neat. He knows the church protocol. He, he, he's got his will and his ways, but in some ways he's stayed with his father. He's a dreamer, but he's not a mover. He has enough grace to receive his goods, but not ask for them. He never even says thank you. And he doesn't really say anything until what happens. His brother gets blessed. Now, parents, had the father addressed this in the appropriate way, it would have been great. Now, this father had some great attributes, but he let this one get away from him. The father, he's in the field at the end of the story, and it's obvious that he's been watching and waiting for the son to come home. He has been hoping. He's been looking. He's been asking. It's what fathers do. Many of you know what I'm talking about. We know this because the Scripture states, while he was still far away off, his father saw him, felt compassion for him, ran out and embraced him and kissed him. He put the best robe on him. He put a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet. He said, I want you to go and get the fattest steer you've got and take it to Keter's. Slaughter that thing. Pick up some of that sausage while you're there. We're about to have a barbecue. You see, the father knew what it meant to celebrate what he had been passionate about asking his Lord about. The, these parents had messed up. But there's no doubt in my mind, I know it's a parable, guys, but Jesus taught parables as truth because this is what was unpacking in his culture. And it's what's unpacking in ours as well today. I mean, it's good for his day. It's especially good for our day. And so he's, he's saying this father slipped up. He messed up. He made a mistake. There's a reason why God had interpreted and spoken what he had spoken on how to raise a family up. 
the father had somewhat messed up, but he didn't give up. The father spent time and he welcomed his son back. You know, I have to believe that this father was probably his number one trait and characteristic was consistency. He was a consistent man. May have even been a boring man. Y'all didn't get that. Sometimes consistent just sounds boring. Let's, let's shake it up. Let's break it up a little bit. Well, wait a minute. Depends on what you're talking about. I believe he was consistent. He was consistent in his prayers for this son, this child who was once lost, this sheep who was once lost is now found again. He was consistent. Listen, parents, I know many of you were with us over this past week talking about kingdom families. And, and we just can't get around the overall impact we have when we are consistent in who we are. It takes a relationship with our Heavenly Father and consistency there in order to bring it here. You know, you can't control the sea out there, but you can control what goes on in your boat. <laughs> okay, you didn't get it. I don't know why I put it in there. Hey, church, sometimes I just surprise myself. You ever seen the show Deadliest Catch? I love to watch it. I don't like the language. But you understand that there's a captain in the ship, and when the storms come in and they're major storms, he's got to do what? He's got to turn that boat, and he's got to face those storms. He's got to face those waves, and that boat has to roll. And if he loses control, it will turn sideways and eventually flip the boat. Sometimes that's what culture, all the time that's what culture, that Satan's strategy is for us to lose control to the point that we sink the ship. Look, you can't control the sea, but you can control what goes on in the boat. And do that by being consistent. God loves all of us as, as if there's only one of us. That's a beautiful thought in my mind because God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He is consistent and He loves all of us as though there were just one of us. In our own family, we go through this a lot. I've, I've shared this with you, but uh, all the older siblings think the youngest sibling gets the most love. Until one day I had to say, she does. In this house, no one is loved more than her. And you need to know why. Because when Wade was born, there were only three of us, really only two of us could love Wade in our house. By the time Bethany came along, there were three of us to love Bethany. By the time Emily came along, there were, I don't know. I'm not a mathematician. Four of us. And then by the time Hadley comes along, oh, there's five of us. And it wasn't just me who spoiled her. All of us. Better take responsibility for that nonsense. Anyway, <laughs> here's the truth. Our God loves all of us as if there were just one of us. He's got all of these children, but He hears us when we are consistently on our knees, when we're walking with Him. There is not a son or a or a daughter, there is not a father or a mother that does not like to be in communication with their family unless their family is broken. Be consistent. Consistency is so important. You see, uh, it doesn't mean that we won't discipline one more than the others. They may require that. It doesn't mean that we'll spend the same exact amount of time with each of them. It, it, it doesn't mean that we're going to meet all of their wants. I mean, I've got a daughter that's almost 17 that doesn't have a cell phone. I've got, I've got a daughter that's, that's 14 and she's like, dad, I gotta have one. You see, here's the thing. In the house, though, our love, our love must be consistent throughout. We've got to love all of them as though there's just one of them. Jesus speaks another parable of 99 and yet one being lost. This one's got to take my attention for now. I've got to go. If a man owned the land, he was successful. That's what this parable means. He, 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 he's a successful man. And there was an expectation of an inheritance from his children. A responsibility, though, must be taken place as well for the inheritance to happen. Children were taught from a young age to memorize Scripture. These two sons, even in a parable, should have known better. Our own Heavenly Father is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He teaches us through His own consistency. Had the Father, had the parents remained consistent 
in these children's life, a parable wouldn't have to be told. See, that brings me to my second point. Persistence. Parents, we've got to be consistent and we've got to be persistent. Most parents are persistent with their children. They are. But you must keep going, keep pushing, keep being the example of their faith. Bring them to church, worship with them, teach them, encourage them, never give up, even at, at difficult times. Don't stop. Remember, all throughout scriptures and the ancient church, we have this theme. It's known as the perseverance of the saints. If we can persevere before them, we can have an expectation that they too will persevere. We've got to, pers- we've got to persevere in our teaching. Be persistent in your teaching. It's not always about what you say. It's about what you do. Of course, we reap what we sow. Church, turn off the TV. Turn off the unchristian music. Turn on worship music, books, games, dates. Those things are very important. Don't cheapen the gospel. Preach it and teach it for what it is. Develop a vision in them. Encourage them through your teaching. You know, Miles, one of the things he spoke about was the difference between training and teaching. And as he unpacked this truth, I realized that I'm more of a trainer than a teacher. Allison's far more of a teacher probably than a trainer. It's just the difference in us, but it's how God brought us together to minister to our family. H. Clay Trumbull states the difference this way. He says, it has been said that the essence of teaching is causing another to know. It may similarly be said that the essence of training is causing another to do. I have a way to cause others to do. You better do it or go to your room. Anyway, let's keep going. Right? Teaching gives knowledge. Training gives skill. Teaching fills the minds. Training shapes the habits. Teaching brings the, to the child that which he did not have before. Training enables a child to make use of that which is already in his possession. He who knows how to teach a child is not competent for the oversight of a child's instruction unless he also knows how to train a child. And Proverbs 22, 6 says what? Train up a child. Right? Train up a child. We are called to lead in our teaching, to persevere, to, to, to persevere in our leading. Learn to lead by example. Are we sacrificing our kids to false idols today? It's amazing to me how busy our children are, how the culture has them. It seems like at every waking moment. Careful with that. Don't sacrifice your kids to false gods. Encourage and equip them through your leadership. Remember these words. What, re- what is rewarded is repeated. So learn to encourage, learn to equip them, learn to have an expectation that they're going to listen to you because you have persevered and your leadership goes before them and they are drawn to that. And then when you see them taking care of the inheritance at hand, isn't it a great day when you pull into the driveway and there's some trash in the yard and oh my goodness, my child wasn't even told. They went out and picked it up. They're learning to be responsible with their inheritance. Reward that if you want it repeated, church. See, be consistent and persistent in your leadership. Jesus said, if a blind man leads a blind man, both fall into a pit. We are supposed to be called and led by the Holy Spirit. And that's what leads us to lead our children. David Jeremiah stated it this way, for most little girls, life with a father is a dress rehearsal for love and marriage. One of the greatest things a father can give to his children is the love of his mother and the love of his wife. Lead through your prayers. And I'm going to end with this, church. It's so important. Be consistent and persistent and and lead in your prayers. Hear the words of the Lord because the ways of the Lord are right. Ephesians 1, 17, well, James 5, 16 says, The effectual and fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Ephesians 1, 17 through 19, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you spiritual wisdom and revelation in your growing knowledge of Him. Notice what he says. He says, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, before I go anywhere else, I hit my knees, I bow them before my Father. And I pray to the Father of glory that He may give you. I beg on your behalf. 
I pray for spiritual wisdom upon you and upon, upon my children. I want them to know the ways of the Lord, the best protection for your child today, church. The best protection your child will ever have is the ability to be led by the Holy Spirit. Teach them. Show them. See, when is the last time we've prayed for some like this? Someone like this. Francis Chan tells his pastors this. If you're not praying for your people by name, don't do anything else. If we're not praying for our families by name, stop everything else and start there. Listen, there are some battles, there are some storms, there are some waves that are too large for us to lead through on our own for sure. We had a battle a couple of years ago. The only way it could be won was not by my words, not through my mind but through the ability to go to my Father in glory who looks to distribute what He has among us so that we don't walk through this life as orphans, but as children of the Most High God, and we have that ability within us to lead our own families into what's true, into what's right of the Lord. You see, our world is changing, our country is changing, and unless we raise our children to be led by the Holy Spirit, they're not going to make it. Those are bold words, but I mean them. To have strength with all the saints of the past and endure in their faith to the end. Unless we are raising up disciples and children who have that type of fire from within, they're not going to survive. But once they are rooted in the love of Christ, we don't have to worry about their future because greater is He that is in them now than He that is in the world. See, pretty soon the wind is going to come, the sun sun is going to beat down, and those who are scattered, the the seed that's scattered among the rocks is going to sprout quickly but dry up just as fast, if not faster. In the prodigal story, how much time do you think the father, and yes, the mother as well, spent on their knees over their children? The Scripture states that while the son was still far off, the father ran to him. The expectancy of the return. You see, I believe he said these words or as it played out. I, I, I know it's a parable, but as it would play out, that's my son. That's his walk. That's his stature. Those are stature. Those are his shoulders. I remember that limp from when he was 12 and broke his leg. That's my boy and he's coming home. I won this battle. After I failed in all that I did or felt like I failed in all that I brought them up in. I never left my knees. I was consistent. I was persistent. And that's my boy. I'm running to him. And he draped himself around his neck. And he held on to him. He had prayed for this day. And now it was among him. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Father God, just as Solomon taught us, through skillful and godly wisdom is a house, a home, a life, a family built. And by understanding it established on a good and solid foundation. And by knowledge shall the chambers of its every area be filled with pleasant riches. Father, may those corridors of our homes be filled with your pleasant riches. Father, teach us to teach our children. Give us hearts that endure. Let us be found faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll ask church if you'll please stand. If the altar team would make their way forward. And if you'd like to receive prayer, if God's impressed something upon your heart this morning, come and let us continue to water that seed that God Himself has planted. So that when the sun-scorched days hit this earth, you will not wither, but you will grow. It's good to have you with us this morning, church, both here and online. May God bless you and your families.